beautiful. This segment is sponsored by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit SANS.org to learn more. Also, check out John and I's class on SANS 550, Active Defense, Offensive Countermeasures, and Cyber Deception. Accept no active training substitutes. Training, yeah. And by Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. Visit Tenable.com for more information. Don't forget to register for Source Boston coming up on April 25th through the 28th. They have fabulous training. They have a fabulous lineup of keynote speakers, fabulous tra- uh, people who are giving other presentations. It's going to be well, fabulous. And we'll be there selling Hack Naked t-shirts as well. So make sure you come to Source Boston happening next week, April 25th through the 28th. Visit sourceconference.com for the details. Security Week listeners receive 10% off products in our store with the discount code IHACKNAKED, which now include Hack Naked stickers. Visit shop.securityweekly.com and get yours today. Larry is teaching SANS 617 wireless, wireless Ethical Hacking and Defense Coming up on Baltimore, Maryland, June 13th through the 20th, and Berlin, Germany, 22nd through the 27th, and lots more places, so be certain to check out the SANS website for more course offerings. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Stories of the Week. We have everyone on from the previous segment, including Gavin, who's sticking around to help us talk about And he has a vest now. He's, it's very, he's looking very dapper now. Thank you for that, Gavin. It's very nice. It's very nice. Thank you. I suppose we should start out by talking about Logjam. Gavin, do you want to lead in with this? Because you actually mentioned this on the call with, with myself the other day. It, it, tell us about Logjam. You seem to be read up on it a little bit. So, uh, Yeah, so uh, I was asked to comment on it in a couple of places. I, I think, yeah, like many of the uh, SSL TLS vulnerabilities, it's a hangover from the export restrictions that the U.S., uh, put in in the late 90s, uh, this time on Diffie-Hellman, uh, you know, very similar to Freak, where it's a downgrade, uh, mm-hmm. basically moving you from you know, uber lovely secure, secure connections to ridiculously simple ROT13 type uh, encryption. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's really strange with, um, uh, w- with this one. I think that uh, it's very difficult to take advantage of. You have to be on the same network, very similar to like Poodle uh, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yet there's been lots and lots of noise um, around it. You know, let, let's get rid of the old code, patch it, reconfigure it, and move on. Um, you know, the the fact that we have SSL TLS vulnerabilities using old encryption methods uh, is is pretty sad, to be honest. So you have to be on the same network. Um, so, Gavin, tell us, why do they call it Logjam? Oh, I have no idea, actually. That's a really good question. I don't know. Does someone else know that? Does anyone know why they call it Logjam? No, but I'm waiting for the theme song. I, I, I have no idea. I was about to sort of chime in on the, uh, uh, you know, the, the downgrade style of attacks. It's getting a bit ridiculous, right? Backward it's compatibility. Kind of you know, backward compatibility uh, aspects is what what hurt Microsoft for years, and 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 this is sort of the same sort of thing in the in the protocol space. It's like, um, why are these older ciphers and methods still there at all? I mean, there's no device that needs them. Uh, it's it's just ridiculous. So, um, well, yeah, yeah, it's, it's like, sad uh, to see. Yeah, th- those five people still using IE six would be pissed if they can't buy something on Amazon. You know, yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the interesting <laughs> thing is, though, the, the only browser that's actually patched um, against this was Internet Explorer. Hmm. Wow. I think we should drink on that one. I think we oh. should, too. I also noticed in, along the lines of Internet Explorer, they've implemented, and I'm not sure when it was introduced into the code base, but some cross-site scripting protections. Have you noticed that? 
Yeah, I did. You know, I Job, did. Have you noticed that too in penetration testing? I, I, I did. I haven't actually haven't done <laughs> penetration tests much of lately. I've been much in R and D mode, but I I have noticed that, um, which mm. is which is a good move. Uh, and you know, it's the same thing with the Chrome based and stuff. Um, it's it's um. Uh, it, it's always a good thing when the client side does better, um, especially in the browser space, because you know that's such a, uh, um, yeah, you know, that that is the platform now, right? I feel I like think. we're getting better in terms of browsers actually implementing security against web applications. Yeah, I mean, it's um, you know, sandboxing is a very good thing as well. I mean, when you've got browsers that uh, effectively are multiple applications in the same memory space, um, that's that's some big challenges, right? Um, uh, which is what we've been struggling with for a long time. But I don't mean to digress and go off down another page here. Uh, I think we are still on logjam, unless you want to move on, Paul. No, I was kind of moving on. It, it doesn't seem a lot of that interesting to me, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's just yet another one of those, um, uh, <laughs> yet another, uh, you know, downgrade style attack. Um, yeah, I, well, I, 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 did, I, there was, I, I was interesting in it, though. I, I was okay. wondering, Gavin, um, in terms of the details, you said it was Diffie Hellman, and my understanding of Diffie Hellman is it's it's primarily used for a key exchange um, yeah, yeah. in in uh, the TLS SL space. Have you got any more detail on on um, on the fact that you have to be on the same network, and why is that the case? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, yeah. Um, I uh, it, it's uh, very very similar, I think, to Poodle, where you're uh, renegotiating both the client and the server. Yeah, but you have to be near either the client or the server. Uh, but apart from that, I've I've not read into any any more details on it. Mm, okay. Well, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I'll, I'll I want to dig in a little bit more myself. Um, but um, I'm not so sure about the uh, given the given the same network constraint and everything else. I'm not so sure about the um. The practical application from a penetration testing perspective or intact perspective of of, of um, wide usability, but um, until I get yeah. deeper in, I don't know. Yeah, it it but, almost seemed like the the bigger implication at this point was if I patched and you didn't, and then we tried to have a connection, it wouldn't work. Which which could be where the logjam concept came from. Um, but the, the other th thing that's kind of interesting, I mean, if, if you like the crypto and the history behind it, I only skimmed the article and I, I pulled up the academic paper and it's the kind of thing you're probably going to want to sit down and actually work through. But if you've ever worked through the crypto, it, it talks about assumptions that we made based on prime numbers and, and what we thought we could do, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago and the things that we're learning now. And I always find that even if from an applicability perspective, this isn't huge, you'll do something about it now. It's great to be able to go look at assumptions that we've made and now say, okay, you know what? Not the right assumption. Okay, good. Let's learn. But let's learn from that. And so I think that's our opportunity. Yeah. One thing I do know is, you know, diffie Holman, uh is based on uh, exponentiation with prime numbers um, and yes. the um, the key assumption is that it's an NP complete problem to reverse uh, that exponentiation. Uh, and if look at you dropping knowledge, yeah, <laughs> well, well, I got I got a little crypto background, but that's going to be a sweeper. I love it. If if the exponentiation um, factor is not large enough, of course, then there's a challenge there of brute force. Um, but um, yeah, it's still you know it's still significant. The assumptions case, um, Michael, that you're talking about is, is essentially based on how, um, how small that, that prime number exponentiation is given the assumptions right. of computing platforms of the past. Um, and that's always been the case with, with crypto in general anyway, because uh, you, you look at some of the block cipher algorithms and we've had to go to long and lo longer and longer key lengths and uh, more rounds of encryption and things like this as, as we've dealt with um, the abilities of parallel compute hardware to actually brute force things. So, I mean, that's applicable. Well, and so, and, and so again, I'm just, I'm just going to kind of make the point again because you're helping me remember a couple of things about this that I think are interesting too. Crypto is still interesting to us. And, and there are protocols and there's ways of making it work and there's, there's the algorithms which are separated from the keys. All really good stuff. And we're finding more and more that it's really important to us, including... How did you implement it? And that does mean now we have to kind of go back and go, oh, we've always done it this way. May not actually be the right way. We have to kind of check some of those assumptions on, on implementation. And that's, I think that's, one, that's a good one reminder. Of the things, that's it. 
one of the things that's challenging is crypto crypto comes out of theoretical uh, and practical applications of mathematical algorithms and the implementers of of cryptography uh, are often not intimately familiar with those algorithms and therefore they're copying them from a book or you know whatever whatever the source is and sometimes they're implemented poorly uh, and and you know it's probably more often than we actually know uh, and and as testers in the industry you know, uh, putting on the penetration ha testing hat for a minute, are we actually digging deep enough to to test the efficacy of a crypto algorithm? And most likely the answer to that is not in most cases because there's much more fun, lower-hanging fruit that we can get our, get our goal with and we don't need to go that far. Um, so it's, it's going to be an area that, you know, as more and more of these things come out, poor implementations are going to result in, in more exposures and more vulnerabilities. Now, backward compatibility uh, arguably is not a poor implementation. Um, that's really something where we just need to cut the leg off and move on, you know. But uh, that, that's a that's a different issue. And, and Joff, I think what's really interesting is that the people that implemented this actually probably did have a good idea on how to do cryptography, but they were told to make it weak because of political pressure. And yeah. mm -hmm. you know, we're having exactly the same issue right now. So in the UK, we have the Snoopers Charter. Uh, and in the US, you, you're getting all kinds of pressure with regards to front door access to encryption. And you know, I think what we have to remember is you know, if we implement things today that give you know, agencies access, it will hurt us in 20 years' time. Because that's exactly why we're, we're experiencing these problems right now. You know, people are exposed to um, you know, uh, hackers breaking in and stealing data because of something that happened 20 years ago. Let, let's not make the same mistake again. Yeah, it's, that's a very tough one because if you look at some of the uh, code bases that are running today, um, you know, those of us who are, who've been in the industry a while, myself included, we know they're based on, on guys that, uh, you know, probably guys, gals, X generation that wrote these, this code in C you know, 25 years ago, and it still it still appears in products, and it's still getting exploited and stuff. And when you've got a software stack that's getting so deep uh, over time that there's so much uh, so much abstraction from those original code bases, that some of these uh, some of these exposures, some of these vulnerabilities that are found, can be very very wide range, uh, uh, um, broad impact because of the uh, the 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 extent that that old code base potentially impacts. Um, so I'm not quite sure where I was going with that. Other than, other than um, the the fixability is is a non-trivial matter in in some cases in the in the foundational object library uh, space. I, well, I, think, I think we that, we that wanted to talk about the airline hacking news that happened this week, since it's very timely. And Paul's ready for the segue, so that was, yes. that, was that was fun though. Thanks. That was fun, right? I feel uh, like we just got brute forced. <laughs> you did. <laughs> so I. You know, we had, <laughs> excuse me, we had Chris Roberts on the show. He came on and told his side of the story. FBI has released what I believe is their side of the story, and I think that the media has their side of the story. A lot of people have weighed in. And look, you know, we're a show. We bring people on. We ask them questions, and they answer them. And you can take that at face value. Um, I, I think there's a lot of evidence that still needs to be presented in this particular case, uh, I think it's kind of premature for people to pass judgment. Um, certainly, there's a lot of speculation still. And certainly, you know, a lot of the actors uh, in this, particularly the FBI and the media, are known to uh, sometimes not represent what is necessarily 100% of the truth or twist some things, uh, which could be what's coming on. Now, I'm not defending Chris, but he we did come on the show and did give his side of the story. Uh, as well. So take it for what it's worth. I just, you know, that's kind of my two cents on the whole thing. I thought that our friend uh, Robert Graham had a great article that essentially I agree with the way Robert presented uh, his article. The link is in the show notes, so you should read it. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to it. is he claiming something he's not done to highlight the issue? Or is he grandstanding? And uh, my hope is that he's claiming something that he's not done to highlight the issue and get it addressed. We call that stunt hacking. So yeah. uh, Chris Gates published an article this week that's in the show notes as well, wiki.securityweekly.com to read our show notes. He published an article on stunt hacking, and he said, 
he kind of he presents it on both sides of it as well. He said, you know, and the, the one hand, you don't know exactly how you know Chris feels on the issue based on his article necessarily. I want to put words in his mouth, but you know, my take on stunt hacking is sometimes it's got to be done to highlight an issue, right? Like someone's got to fall on the sword. Yeah. But on the flip side, some people acquire some random device from eBay. They give a talk at a big conference. They talk about how to hack it. And they're like, this is really bad. And the research is kind of flaky. And it's not necessarily an issue. So that's kind of the other side to stunt hacking. <clears throat> I think there's two sides to that. And being in embedded security um, and focusing on that for a, as long as I have, I've certainly seen my fair share of that. People just taking random devices and going, oh, look, security is poor. We have a big problem. And it's just really one device, and that attack doesn't necessarily traverse to other devices, so is it really a big deal? Yeah. I mean, I think there's another <laughs> aspect of that, too, isn't there? The, the societal sensitivity today yeah. is, is so much higher um, that, you know, we, we've had these big events um, across the world that um, have raised people's attention to the point where we're sort of on, on edge um, in, in the Western world, for sure. And, uh, you know, that culmination of factors, um, you know, does not play well for that kind of um, public publication of stuff when you're on a plane. Uh, so it's, you know. Well, yeah, and, and look, I, I wrote about this a little bit in, um, in, in the book, uh, Into the Breach. And, and what I looked at specifically was if it bleeds, it leads. But then, but then we also start to, to find ourselves in a little bit of a challenge where we sometimes struggle to translate the complexity of this. Uh, but with even within our industry, especially with something like this, and then the media is very interested in getting somebody on screen. And mm -hmm. even if you've done media interviews and you've prepped for it and you you know how to pivot, right? And you you get it. It doesn't always mean that that's what makes it onto the air because they're going to cut to the yeah. things that they think that oh, they think true. makes sense. Yeah. And I'm I'm not knocking it. I'm not saying but it's not it's not that there's an agenda. It's that sometimes there's really just misconceptions, misunderstanding. I mean, you know, we just talked about the nuances of code bases that are 20 years old. So we're talking about the nuance of something that we could teach a five-day class on, and you want a, a 90-second media clip on it, including the setup and some B-roll footage and two people interviewing about it. And and naturally, we're going to go to the stuff that's a little more salacious, so it's a little bit more exciting. And, you know, as Paul pointed out, there's some advantages right now of, of – um, creating conditions that allow you to exert more control over things or to get a bigger budget. I mean, we do this insecurity all the time, and some of us decry it, and now we're seeing it happen in politics. It really shouldn't shock anybody. What I liked um, that you opened us up with, Paul, is that you know there, there's an opportunity here to kind of let things settle. Like anytime something big happens, you won't see me comment on it too often because I'm personally trying to weigh it and figure it out. I think there have been some missteps here. But I want to go back to the stunt hacking thing for a second because mm. I've been thinking about something for about 24 hours or so, um, looking at some of the stuff that, I mean, you know, I, I love Chris and the stuff that he writes and that the kind of prompted some thinking. And I, I maybe have mentioned this before because it really stood out at me. It was a, a weekend edition of the Wall Street Journal. So they, they print like um, more tech stuff on the weekends. In fact, I, I think the tech coverage from Wall Street Journal is actually really good. And it was a front page and it was talking about parents and it used the word hacked that have hacked insulin pumps. Now, the last time we heard about hacked insulin pumps, it was at DEF CON and it was very bad and it caught a lot of headlines. Well, this was actually really good. People were behind it because it was talking about the ability to monitor your child's insulin pump even if you weren't right next to them. And by these, these families coming together and figuring out how to hack this and connect it to cell phones, they were affording their kids a, a level of freedom they previously didn't have. And, and, and it was really lauding this. And I realized something. A lot of the stunt hacking that we do and a lot of the hacking that we do, we're very focused on breaking and proving to you how bad it is. And LPS, how smart we are. And what I think maybe we need to, you know, we talked about this before. Or, you know, I always call it amplify the good. Where's the stunt hacking where somebody says, hey, guys, look what I, what, look what I fixed. Look how I was able to solve a problem. Look at some of the things we were able to do that are really good. We don't have those examples to point to. If we had some of those, we might counterbalance some of this and then get into much better conversations about hacking and research 
and and these types of things that we'd like to see. But it, I just I wanted to put that out for food for thought because what struck me was it was a medical device we'd already seen that had been hacked. It was a completely different story, portrayed a completely different way. Uh, admittedly, it was for the children, but it was um, I don't know. I just it's it's food for thought. I, I'd like to see some some stuff where we show a positive, not just a negative. Well, yeah, I think there's that aspect, um, Michael, and I think you raise a good point. But then the you know the other aspect is that the that uh, we have a degree of responsibility uh, in in the community as well to uh, to um, actually uh, to educate uh, with with our knowledge. I mean, if you have if you have an opportunity to take a family member or a friend aside, and they're asking you about you know stuff that's hitting the hitting the media, um, you can actually open their eyes and 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 inform them on more of a of a rounded viewpoint from a security professional's perspective. Um, and that, you know, I think that's, that's really important. It also, it gives us the opportunity, like you point out to emphasize the good, uh, in, in what we do, uh, and, 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 and the potential good and what we could do. Um, so, but the other part of the degree of responsibility is just not to be, um, um, you know, not to put scare things out there, uh, for, for yeah, don't be a dick is what you're saying. Well, yeah, yeah I, I sometimes feel like we are. Yeah, in this really weird, isolated place where, yeah, let, let's put it in the real world. We're like the 1% of people that know how to build safe cars and drive them safely. And 99% of other people don't know how to do it. And we're kind of lauding ourselves that, that we can get from A to B without crashing. Oh, and by the way, we're not really going to tell you how to do it. We'll just show you all the crashes that happen because you don't know how to do it. You know, I, I do agree. Is, is I, that, I, I, is, are you saying that that's the UK because you drive Jaguars and stuff and they're really safe? Is that? I, I love uh, that analogy. <laughs> I love that analogy, actually, um, yeah, because that, yeah. that does the Yeah, the, the only thing I, I take an exception with is that, um, I, I, to twist that analogy a bit, we fancy that we are the only ones that know how to build really safe, really effective cars and nobody else does. And so we're going to point out all the flaws. But when push comes to shove and somebody says, OK, fine, you build the car. We're like, oh, yo, man, I'm just I'm just a breaker. Yo, it's not that's not me. Don't you can't make yeah, me do we it. Step away from the microphone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the vulnerabilities. Come on. Yeah, that's what we need. You know, when Shell Shock 2 comes out. Yeah, we there should be the worms that actually go around and patch the vulnerability rather than exploit it. There you go. Yeah. Well, what's Robert Morris up to these days? Look, you know, but there's a, there's a secondary thought to this too, and this one's half baked um, because it just came to me today. But we had a bridge built here, uh, not a bridge to nowhere. It was a bridge in in Myrtle Beach, and there's some, and I'll go dig up some of the history on it if, if this if this plays. But basically, um, there's a bunch of roads. Myrtle Beach is growing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, there's a there's a major thoroughfare, and they've started building bridges that rise over parts of it, right? Myrtle Beach is, is flat. Um, and so typically what they do is they just mound a bunch of dirt, they drop girders onto it, and, and boom, they've got a bridge. Well, it turns out in the testing on this particular area, the soil isn't adequate for that. And so what would have been, and I, I'll go look at the numbers, somewhere like a 30 to $50 million project became like a $250 million project, right? And it, instead of taking a year, it took like three to five years. But here's the caveat. At the very end of the project, they went back and they did a number of tests and they said, well, hold on. This wasn't adequate. This wasn't adequate. This wasn't adequate. And you need to fix it. And they came back and fixed it. And it was a tune of 10, 15, 20 million dollars. Now, the city didn't pay for that because it was in the contract, what quality it needed to be, what the specs were. They went back. They had a measure and a, an ability to test it. And, and what kind of struck me on it was $250 million is a lot of money. You know, 10, 15, even $5 million to fix a problem with pavement. That's a big amount of money. And I find a lot of times we're very quick to say in security something along the lines of, well, it would cost too much. Well, it would take too long. We couldn't possibly do it. And yet, in our regular analog world, we do that kind of stuff all the time. And so, I think when we're talking about educating people and we're looking at some of these analogs, you know, the question is, if this starts to rise to the level of safety, right? Obviously, you don't want bridges to collapse and roads to degrade quicker. So we need to start learning from other disciplines that define their terms, that have their models, that include testing into it, and then have enforcement of that testing. And the numbers aren't really that far askew, like in terms of just absolute dollars. And so I just, I think that, 
<laughs> he thinks something. Yeah. My, yeah, he's thinking something. Mike, if you really want to see the, uh, bridges falling and roads that are degrading, you need to come here to Rhode Island. I believe in a <laughs> recent survey, Rhode Island was number two for the worst roads in America in terms of their condition. So you on have that to look forward Rhode to Island when you come visit. So I, I think wait, there's, a, there's a theme that's running through my, what Mike was saying, though, and, and I think uh, the theme really is... Um, the maturity of the industry, right? It's the maturity of the approach. It's the, you know, can can we uh, can we come at things with a much more positive uh, spin, and, and instead of just going for the I like breaking things, and well, learn yeah. from others. We don't have to recreate any wheels or models. Uh, other people have done similar things. We're not that unique. Yeah, but but we think we are, and there's the challenge, yep. right? Well, we're yeah, all I'm... we're all precious snowflakes. We're special snowflakes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that the biggest problem with this uh, current story is that it scares the living shit out of everybody. You know, like, so Barnaby Jack, yeah. he stands up on stage and he spits out a load of dollar bills and no one really cared about it. It's like, that's really cool. That's really interesting. It kind of really drove people's thinking towards, well, we really should secure this stuff. But when it comes to an aeroplane and I'm flying, you know, on my honeymoon in a couple of weeks' time with... <coughs> My, my wife and, and uh, daughter, you know, obviously I'm educated, I know that it's not a problem, but others are probably sitting there thinking, oh my God, I hope there's not a hacker sitting there next to me um, trying to break into shit. Uh, and so... You, yeah, so can you imagine cracking open your hacking exposed on an airplane now? Uh, yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like opening the Koran. <laughs> 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 well, we avoid all the touchy topics on this show. <laughs> yeah, where can we go from here? WordPress uh, vulnerabilities? Anyway. Can we go to WordPress vulnerabilities? Exactly. No, there's no, another no. one, right? There's got to be another one. So week. there's a SQL injection vulnerability in Feed WordPress, and there's a cross scripting vulnerability in WP Photo Album Plus 6.12, just to round out our WordPress vulnerabilities for this of week. Of course. And, and there's, so let me know, ask a question on this then. Because we're, we're, we are today trying to trend more positive, and we're seeing more and more of these coming up. So is this because now we're looking for them and we're seeing them, or, uh, or is this, are we still at the beginning of this and we're going we're gonna to spiral deeper? And if so, what do we need to do to pull out of this? Uh, so <sighs> I, I would say to that is, I, yeah, I, I would say the, the, the mid, mid Or late- Gavin for that matter. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the 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 late nineties and early part of the decade were characterized by operating system vulnerabilities, right? I yeah. think everybody would probably agree with that. No, I, I think the web app vulnerabilities were there, just no one cared about them as much. No one cared about it. What's happening is vulnerabilities, uh, uh, f- effectively by focus, are migrating up the stack. So what we're seeing is application, application, application. Why? I I think the the operating system side uh, of the house got its stuff in order for the, yeah, for yeah. the large I would agree with that. Yep. For for the large percentage, right? And especially, you know, the major OSs, uh Windows and 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 the like. You know, they got they got their act together, right? So so they they stopped being the focus of attack and the applications are the focus of attack. Well, here's the issue. Applications uh, attack space is so much bigger. Mm. Um and mm. so this is just the beginning in my opinion, Mike. Um, we're going to see uh, lots and lots of right. Lots. So it's, you, it's, you could it's even the separate in terms of the application space. But what about for WordPress? Oh, specific? you're being specific on WordPress. Oh, and I was trying to no, go. I, with I like general, general road. road no, but... it's good. I look, I'm giving you a clap. Uh, right? um, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, WordPress. Yeah, can, I, uh, can, can I can I admit to my favorite hobby? Um, so whenever yeah, a new WordPress vulnerability comes out. I love to parse the top 100 security uh, blogs that uh, that all you guys have to figure out whether you're vulnerable to it. Uh, and uh, you'd be amazed <laughs> <Right on. laughs> the amount of people <laughs> that are vulnerable to these things. Um, Paul, you better go look at your logs. <laughs> not us, because when we talk about them, there's someone behind the scenes that's fixing them as we talk about them. Right now, right at this, right very, at this very moment. We actually don't run those two plugins, but... Yeah. So, yeah. Well, so I, I don't can know we how to fix this the for one more Mike, second. I don't I don't know how to fix the WordPress problem because Well, let me ask you a question <clears throat> though. So, uh, and I'm going to juxtapose two things and they, they may not be a perfect fit, but we're seeing lately Netflix is releasing a lot of their security information and they're releasing tools and they're releasing their tools open source and they're they're putting a lot of effort behind saying, "Hey, we we can do better at this." 
I hate calling on other people to do something. So my question is, does does automatic, does WordPress at the codex level have some level of control? I mean, if if we look at models, right, Apple now uh, and even Google Play at Android, uh, they have certain restrictions now they put around apps, they test apps, they test things. WordPress is open source for the most part. Uh, and these apps are both a mixture of open source and paid. And, uh, and well, gosh, these, these, I mean, so we're, what, what's interesting about this, we, we're going to keep piling on, but we're not really describing what the challenge to this is. And the challenge is this isn't just an old company pumping something out. There's something, and we've, we've pointed out vulnerabilities in the core. So we, we get it, but we've also complimented the WordPress team on hitting those vulnerabilities really quick. So my question then is, is this an opportunity for them to exhibit leadership? And then is there something that we need to do as a community to support that or, or what? No, I think your, your answer is yes, certainly to your first question, Mike. And I'm going to draw kind of a parallel into the mobile space. So we've got the iOS and the Apple App Store, which is very tightly controlled. There's a mixture of free and commercial apps in that App Store. Yeah. And great. very similar to, uh, well, and then you have Android, right? Very same thing, but much more open. And WordPress is like the super open where anyone can write a plugin. There's a mixture of free and commercial, mostly free plugins that exist for WordPress. And I think the opportunity is for WordPress to move to more of a more tightly controlled system where there's security controls in the, in the core of it. They're enabling people uh, to, or preventing people from running insecure plugins or protections from insecure plugins. Um, maybe there's also an opportunity to develop a model where people can develop software for WordPress and actually make a living at it. I would pay $2 or dollar for a WordPress plugin that I know is written to a certain standard uh, and yep. the developer cares about security because I'm going to pay for your plugin. You, you know, it better not make my list every week that we read of WordPress vulnerable plugins. And I think that so has a chance to sounds, preserve yeah. the functionality that we get from all of these plugins, which I, is why we use WordPress. I think there's so also an almost opportunity sounds... to to write an overlay um, plugin plugin update functionality as well as as mm. secure the core a little bit. So I think there are some op- there's definitely some opportunities. I think it's product maturity. Um, challenges largely what we're seeing here. Um, yeah, but you know what I what I just liked is it, it, it minimally uh, an option here is to create a path that says, hey, if you want your plugin validated, uh, we're happy to do it. And, and you know it's interesting, right? Because don't we validate we validate our XML feeds now, right? And there's all sorts of free ways to validate your uh, your code, and there's there's ways to validate any number of things. And it'd be really curious because we keep seeing right there's SQL injection, there's cross site scripting, there there are things that. Maybe I'm um, oversimplifying uh, the ability to check for some of these, but it'd be it'd be interesting. Maybe even um, an opportunity for some of the security vendors to say, "Hey, um, we'll help you partner with this." If you're if you're a developer creating some of this, we'll help you check for these things, right? Because right, I don't I, I'm not thrusting back on automatic as a company, but but gosh, they could create a pathway that said, you know, there's a checkbox here. We we did this. It's been through the security check. Yeah. Um, and all we're checking for is this, right? Top 20 things, top 10 right. things, but gosh, it's, I feel like we need to start something and then it, it, it's incumbent on us to start to populate some answers. And this is where I get to say, and I don't know how to code, so sorry guys, I can't be part of it. But if you want to communicate it, you want to talk about it, I'm happy to talk about it. Well, and like what you're talking about is like the black phone model for validating the applications in Android, right? These have gone through yeah. some level of checking <clears throat> and I think that model applies here. Yeah, because that way too we're not we're not saying look you just you're trying to run a blog and this isn't you know it's small it's it's on its own server. <clears throat> Mike's kids are gaming or something. Tonight. I'm telling you, he keeps <laughs> just going Netflix dropping or totally something. Offline. Something. The, the the Witcher three at sixty frames per second. Uh, I think. Here's the kicker. I'm home alone. Um, I restarted the router and my network before this. And, uh, you know, we could just think, uh, I've got Time Warner. There you go. Uh, well, I, oh, and, well, that and explains I, and I told, it, Mike. That's all you have to say is I have Time Warner. And, and I did hack you while we were sitting here, too. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, Joff, did you that. use the new vulnerability that exists in millions of routers? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think I did. It's a 90s style flaw. It's a 90s style flaw. 
Good segue. You like yeah, that, huh? Brilliant. <laughs> so uh, I read up a little on this vulnerability. Uh, I'm not uh, as well versed in it as I probably should be, but there's a net USB driver that's found in the typical cast of characters: Netgear, D-Link, TP-Link. Linksys is not particularly listed in here, but essentially the driver listens on mm-hmm. TCP port 20,005, contains a major flaw, which I'm assuming is some kind of S printf or you know, similar kind of buffer overflow. Yeah, buffer overflow. Buffer yeah. overflow that you find in a lot of uh, these embedded routers, which is pretty easy to find in firmware. Estimates are that there are a million devices um, 21 other vendors also appear to be ship net USB products. Essentially what this does is listen on a port so that you can connect USB drives over the network and its popular driver. What I find is a, a couple of things in, well, really this highlights one major uh, flaw that I see permeate through embedded systems is that <clears throat> once someone has some working code that works on embedded operating systems, that that code gets replicated because it's hard to code in that small environment. The code has to be highly optimized. It's it's a pain in the butt to code, especially a driver is first and foremost a pain in the butt. Second of all, to get that work on embedded systems, they've replicated that code, and that's why you see a lot of these flaws that are not just in one manufacturer's but go across to many. Uh, driver flaws uh, tend to do that, and lots of other kind of web application flaws as well because they borrow and steal code. Uh, from other sources as well. So I, 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 I wonder if this is a Linux <coughs> driver. I don't know if it's... Uh, <coughs> I haven't looked in to see. I know if it's D-Link or TP-Link. They're using L- Linux, so... Yeah, it, I mean, in the report, it's calling it a Linux kernel driver. <laughs> yeah, so it's a Linux kernel driver that they just replicated, which doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. I, yeah. I, I think one of the biggest problems with this was the apathetic... Um, response the researchers got. I think they first announced, uh, first found it in February, got nothing, and uh, then like pushed them again, and still got nothing, and then they had to announce it because it was like, look, we need to fix this shit. You know, um, it's interesting. Home routers and the manufacturers that represent that space have been notorious, notoriously bad at responding to researchers for several years. I think yeah. so. Let's look at the economics of it. Go mm-hmm. back to Gavin's earlier point in his interview about looking at the economics of it. My guess, without knowing, maybe you guys know, their margins are probably exceptionally low. Mm-hmm. Competition yeah. is exceptionally high. Elasticity, therefore, right, is a, a big concern of theirs. And and they're going to try to respond to a minority of people explaining something highly technical that the bulk of their of their consumer base will never hear. If they hear it, they don't understand it, and they're probably motivated by price. <clears throat> That you yeah. hit the nail on the head on all fronts on that, Mike. And it, that's the primary, all the reasons you listed are why we're in the situation that we're in when it comes to home wireless routers. And, and it, so it, it feels it, like it, then. It, it permeates to some other uh, industries as well. Certainly home automation in a lot of other consumer Well, I was devices. just going to say, this yeah. is going <clears> to <throat> spread, right? Yeah, it's, it's spreading already. So then the, the challenge is. How do we start to make it easier, right? It's, it's a, we often call it the water principle, right? Water will flow in the path of least resistance. So how do we make it easier to, to, to grab stuff that is what we'll, I'll call it secure. I'll put, I'll put air quotes around it, but better. How, how do we make it easier to grab better stuff earlier in the process so that they can get to market as fast and, and do all this stuff and then maybe even start to cite security as a differentiator, is there? I mean, Paul, this this is definitely more your area than I mean. Is if they're grabbing stuff that was already created, is there? Is there, how how do we inject ourselves into that process to show them that they can do it better without with less problems? But could you? I, I guess the question is that I'm asking of myself: Could you create a cheap, secure, wireless embedded router? Uh, we keep coming back to this. We've we've asked this question before. Cheap and secure in the same sentence is dangerous. Yeah, yeah. But Paul, I think that. The, the important thing is, do the public actually care? Mm. A- and, yeah, if, if right. somebody goes to the store to buy a router, uh, they're just going to pick up the one that's got the most aerials because it looks cool, and yep. it's the cheapest <laughs> price. They, d- they don't really care whether it's secure or not. 
I, I over, over here, Gavin, we buy routers. I'm not sure what you with this router <laughs> thing yeah, is. But that you... A router over here. <laughs> oh, would we? Uh, I don't know what you do over in the states, but um, yeah. So yeah, I think. Wait, is, it, is a router like? Is that like a secure router? Is that do you have your routers over there? Are they more secure because you call them they're routers? Most they're most definitely more secure and more eloquent. Uh, so they yeah. certainly sound more eloquent. <laughs> I love it. The, the, the biggest issue is. The, the, the general public, you know, going back to my analogy of the 1% that drive around in safe cars, you know, the, the, the public simply don't care. Mm. And I can remember, I was talking to the head of the PCI council, uh, Jeremy, I can't remember his second name, and uh, I said, well, what we should do is we should put a sticker on every single door of um, uh, shop saying, we are very secure due to da 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 and the shops that don't have that would, you probably wouldn't buy stuff from there. Uh, and we don't have the same thing with. Um, uh, you know, I mean, that's skull and bones on a cigarette packet, right? Yeah. But, but it works. The, it's here's working. the question, right? And, and I know this isn't always going to make a ton of, of friends, but maybe then we're focusing on the wrong things. It's like every time there's a credit card breach. Right? I saw the news today, by the way, Target, they're, they're taking off. And, and, I, and when I tweeted it out, I said, you know, guys, uh, if you're in the IT business right now and you're using Target as an example of breaches and all the things that could go wrong, stop. Um, unless you're going to explain Polar Vortex and the ouster of the CEO uh, for failed expansion into Canada and how the new CEO has completely turned it around and they're kicking ass. Then, then by all means, go ahead. But, but the point is, we always look at it and go, oh, everybody was harmed. And I, I love to point out there's a cost of convenience of payment cards. And boom, like, you know, I don't really see that there's a harm. I, I, I know there were settlements and everything else. I don't see it. So let's go to routers or routers. Um, and let's look at this for a second. Router. It's a router. What's, it's a router. The, what's the problem somebody's trying to solve in, in, at their house, at, at their home? They want their wireless. In fact, man, I saw somebody on Facebook earlier today um, put up a post and they said, I can't wait till I have wires for nothing. I want everything to be wireless. And, and had a substantial number of comments saying, yeah, right on me too. Yeah, right on me too. Yeah, right on me too. And then somebody, right, and this was a, not, a less technical person, and, and somebody said, oh, and wait till you get the internet of things. None of that will have wires. Right. So what we're saying is we want to have a, a, essentially a wireless mesh in our house that anything we pop on that can get on the internet gets on the internet. I want it. There goes Mike again. And Mike, Mike wants you, the internet to work. He's got, so he's all got too many things work. on the internet. That's right. You know what's, you know what's funny is um, the that's what you get for using wireless technology, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was going to so, say, I hate Time Warner. I think is where that was going. Am I back yet? Yes. All right. I I'm well, not the funny I'm part is, I was gonna make a, <laughs> I was gonna make a joke about it right as I cut out. So um, there, there you go for timing. But but let's go back when we looked at this earlier with shadow IT. We said, well, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And so I guess the question is, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Do we need to get better at helping people with fundamental hygiene and protecting their data in better ways, so that wireless is less of a concern or and, and when Carlos has joined us, he's pointed out the problems, and you guys have helped me understand the, the magnitude of this. So I'm not saying it's an if-then or, or either or, but when we look at it and say, well, they're not listening to us, then we look at the economy and scale, we'll go, well, of, of course they're not. Um, then I'm not sure the answer is we'll, we'll make it compulsory. I think the answer is, can we find a path of less resistance for them? Can we take Joff's idea and pull people aside and educate them on the differences? Because I think... Part of the reason that the public is largely disinterested is because the public doesn't largely understand the nuances. Well, and they, um, haven't, got uh, hurt, they haven't got hurt by it yet. Not, they right. haven't been significantly hurt by it. Once, they, once there are significant, uh, they have become significant damage to the general population from one of these uh, router flaws, then um, their attention will be peaked and it'll all of a sudden turn into a legislative issue. Right. Yeah, and but, that terrifies me. And that terrifies me too because that's it's too late by the time we get to the point where the politicians are involved because they invariably well mess it up. I had another word coming to mind. <laughs> but Well, so here's the here's the thing then, right? Everything can't be we already talked about this tonight. Everything can't be a priority. So we've got to get a little bit better at an industry of saying, "Hey, wh where's the priority of the things that we can affect? How do we do it? How do we make it easier? How do right? So I mean, um well, lay down a challenge. I mean, I, I would challenge th these these vendors of home uh, wireless routers. Come talk to us. Come talk to Paul. 
Me, mm. you. Let, let's Not start me. a conversation. I mean, talk to me to explain it. That's it. You guys are the smart ones. Well, no, I'm, Joff, they're I'm not going to do that because they're selling bucket loads of their technology already. There's, there's, there's no market differentiator for what they're doing because, in reality, the general public don't really care about security. Well, well so, and, and there it is, right? I mean, if there's no motivation, if, if the vendor is aware of the problem, which they clearly are at this point, and they're not motivated to build security into their software develop, software development lifecycle, then I, we're just I, we're just blowing in the wind at this point. I, I'm just going to parse two things. We say people don't care about security. In my experience, they care deeply, but they don't know what it means. Um, and that that's exactly. There he goes again. <laughs> He's using that cheap wireless router, isn't he? <laughs> it's, it's a D link, isn't it? Ah. It's D link, isn't it? Like, I wasn't going to name you. a vendor. Is I it, was being nice. I'm naming names. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it is. I can tell you it's old and it needs to be replaced. It's a D-Link, isn't uh, it? Uh, well, it's or very clear that it needs it's to be. It's a D-Link not. or a Nekiro Linksys? Tell you what, neither, I'll neither, come neither. down to your place, Michael, and I will, build you, I will build you a $400 router that is brilliant. Do you want to pay that much or do you want to pay Wicked the secure. Um, Here's the thing. I actually I will pay for convenience and security um, I just apparently have exceeded the life of this router. Oh, but uh, by the way, that $400 is on top of the $400 that you're already going to pay for the hardware-based PC that we have to build it on. Uh, yeah. So it's going to cost you about 800 bucks by the time we're finished. Right. Ah, uh, no, no. No, I Jeff can drive. Can drive. He can drive. He's a local. <laughs> He'll be on I the mean, wrong side of the road, but he can drive. Yeah, I can drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> No, uh, I, know I, you're, I know you're laying it on uh, Michael, but you, know, you made a good point. It, it's all about convenience. If, if I can buy a secure router or router off uh, Amazon and it takes two days to get delivered, or I can buy a normal router off, uh, off Amazon and it gets, it gets here in a day, I'm going to buy the one that gets here in a day. And I like how normal means insecure because that's the standard yes. that we've set for yeah. routers. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, so so two two points. I mean, you can buy routers that are better today. They're more secure. They cost more money, and and we and they sell. We buy them. They make them. Also, when we give consumers choices, we say, "Hey, would you like a more secure bank account, or would you like to have uh, World of Warcraft did this, right? Blizzard did this. They they gave people the ability to secure with two factor, and uh, and it was like five bucks, ten bucks. People people did it by the truckloads. So when it's something that's valuable to them and they appreciate that value, we'll, we will spend on it. Um, I, I think that we've not really, I think that either we've not really made the case for it or we're overstating the risk for it. We're and the answer is probably somewhere between the two. We're, we're overstating the risk and B, they haven't gotten hurt by it enough or, or vice right. versa. They haven't got hurt by it enough. So therefore, the risk is not significant enough yet. For us to, to 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 make the case now, it will become that way. I think, but I, think I, if, I have if, no if, argument with you. If, if the delta difference is five dollars, then I think that people would buy secure things. Yeah, but, but in my yeah, example, it's probably a percentage, my right? example, there's probably, there's it was six hundred and fifty dollars. My delta was about six hundred and fifty. You know, I, now that's an extreme example. But. <clears throat> what a, a lot of people don't understand, especially about security, is that you may or may not be a target and not realize. And I think this kind of ties back to threat modeling has really nothing to do with what we were just talking about. But I did want to talk about Toyota Prius batteries being targeted by car thieves. Because likely if you drive a Toyota Prius, you may or may not be worried about someone stealing your car. Lord knows why someone would want to steal a Toyota Prius, except that it has something very valuable in it that you may not realize has value to the attacker and that is the batteries. And that's a story that's in the show notes as well. I thought that it had is some... Tesla Is Tesla behind this? Tesla's behind this. They're stealing the batteries <laughs> to put into Teslas. That's what they're doing, Mike. That's exactly what it is. So, that's how curiously, it, here's the line for Gavin. Curiously, it is only 800 pounds to replace the battery pack in a Prius in the UK. Uh, however, it's $2,500 in the US. Now, that doesn't add up. Because uh, if my exchange rate calculation is correct, eight hundred pounds is what about sixteen hundred bucks? 
Mm, yeah. This, this is the first that. time ever that it's been cheaper to get something in the UK than the US. It's, oh, it's a small w- miracle. <laughs> yeah, w- w- where, where are I'm they manufactured? Whenever I'm in the States, I, I shop like a rap star on crack because it's so cheap out there. Uh, so, yeah, it's very unusual to have something that is so massively yeah. different. So for some reason, these large chemical lead acid battery banks are cheap in the UK. It must be you have a big factory somewhere in the in North they're Yorkshire they're or something. They're usually nickel metal hydride, right? Or lithium ion. Oh, I don't I mean, know. I'm just... I'm just you they're know, not lead stuff. acid. Yeah. You're a battery it's, guy, Joff. Oh, wait a minute. Are you the guy doing this? Are you building are up you, your battery bank you building, at your house? That's right. He's got it. I, I am, and in my case, they're lead acid, but you're right. Nickel metal hydride, probably, <clears throat> or lithium ion. Um, of course, test. Oh, my, my batteries? Yeah, but AGM is still a lead acid technology. Yep. Yep. Well, then, uh, someone did write in and ask us to clarify something about Venom and say that it's in the driver that doesn't necessarily have to be enabled. So we were talking last week, and we kind of made it seem like that you had to have this floppy drive device enabled, but it's in the driver inside of it that it's exploited. So I wanted to make sure we put that clarification in there. Paul, did you just say floppy? I what did. What a crazy idea. Floppy. Imagine that. Yeah, you were here last week when we talked about that, Joff. It was very floppy. It was a floppy conversation. It's a floppy conversation. To say the least. When listeners write in with with, uh, uh, corrections, it means it was a floppy conversation. Uh, Uh, Unfortunately for many, the floppy was constantly enabled. Without them even knowing, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's an awkward Saturday night. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We do have a contest for this episode. I do have a question where you can win a free Security Weekly Hack Naked t shirt. And let's see, what was my question? What did Gavin ask me to sign at the bar when we first met? If you can tell me what Gavin asked me to sign at the bar when we first met, and email the answer to psw at securityweekly.com. The first one with the correct answer will get a Security Weekly Hack Naked t shirt in the size and color of your choosing. Yeah, now, for all those people who are thinking about scrolling back in the videotape, do it from memory. That's right. Don't cheat. Okay. It's Don't not cheat. penis. <laughs> it's, it's Thank not, you. Did Thank he you. say? Gavin gave us a, a hint. Not yeah, penis. It's not that. It's not, not penis. <clears throat> Gavin, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. It's nice for ha- uh, having I, I realize you stayed up late. Um, I'd ask Maureen to make a cameo appearance, but she's probably sleeping. She's in a nice ear sleep, yes. very large. Yes. Yeah. It takes her a long time to roll out of bed. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, we'll have to come see you on your little <laughs> island, or you'll have to come see us on this, uh, this big island sometime. I, I'd like to meet you. It was good to meet you. Yeah, Vir- good, virtually, good anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, if you ever come uh, to the office, especially, Gavin, let me know. We can maybe work out a trip here to the studio. Will do. Looking uh, forward to it. <clears throat> Joff and Mike, as always, thank you very much for joining us this evening. It's, it's always a, a pleasure, Paul. Yes, it's been a fantastic show. Uh, thanks, everyone, for watching, and we'll see everyone on the next episode of Security Weekly. 